Hello, this is Jim. Welcome to the channel that aims to be both informative and entertaining. Today's topic is the beast from the east, the giant Japanese salamander. And it's not like this, and not quite like that, it's a monster of such size and power, nor like this. However, it is like this, and that's pretty big. Today we're going to talk about a diver here in Japan with me, Martin. Martin is a local diver, author, and photographer. Martin is a bit of an authority on how to dive with these salamanders, what to look for, how to get there, the equipment, the logistics, the whole deal. If you want to see and learn about how and why to dive with these monsters, stay tuned. Okay, welcome to the channel, everybody. So today we have a real treat. This is uh, a diver I've known for a while here in Japan, Martin, and he's here to talk about the beast from the east, as he calls it. Martin, say hello. Hey, hello, Jim, and to the DDT family out there. Nice to see you. All right, and what are you going to be talking about today, Martin? Yeah, so today I'll be talking about the um, Japanese giant salamanders here endemic to Japan. So um, I guess I'll start, start off about that. Okay, how, how big are we talking here? Um, well, it depends. So uh, these giant salamanders, there's actually three species. Um, don't know if you're aware, aware of that, but there's a Chinese giant salamander, and then we get the, the Japanese giant salamander, and then um, we get the so-called hellbenders. So if we talk about the Japanese giant salamanders, they get to about 150 centimeters. Uh, they're quite large, um, but the largest are the Chinese giant salamanders, and they're about 180 centimeters, they're the biggest and probably the most aggressive as well. And then we get the, the, the hellbenders, which are uh, much smaller, um, they're, less than one meter big, I think. Um, I and yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I think of Hellboy when you say Hellbender, I'm thinking that, you know, with the, the shaved yeah. off. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, and so these, these salamanders are amphibians as you and I know, so I think they're close relatives of frogs. Um, amphibian meaning uh, dual life, I think, in, in, in Greek. Um, as I said earlier, they're close relatives of frogs. So when they're born, uh, they're born as eggs, but then when they hatch, they actually kind of look like tadpoles, right? right. But then they eventually start forming um, arms and legs and frogs lose their tail, but the salamanders retain their tail and then they get much, much bigger. But they kind of look like large lizards. As I said, there's the three main species, the Chinese giant salamander and the Japanese giant salamander and the, the hellbenders. Um, I've only seen the, the Japanese ones here in Japan. Um, and they are known as the living fossil. 30, 50 million years, they've retained their body structure. So they're known as the living fossil. Um, so because of there's a lot of emphasis on conservation here in Japan, I think, um, and they're considered to be a uh, national treasure, you know, in Japan. Oh, so. right. Quickly take this back to the beginning. So how did you even learn about this dive being a possibility? How'd they get on your radar? Diving as part of a dive group somewhere. And somebody told me that you can dive with these giant salamanders out in Gifu. Um, and I had always known about these giant salamanders, but I didn't know that you could actually go out and dive with them because they're actually considered kind of national treasure and they're also mm. on the threatened species list, right? Mm. So that kind of, you know, uh, triggered in my brain and and I wanted to actually get in uh, close and personal with these uh, giant salamanders because they're rare and I think they're quite unique in their own right. Not too many people have done it right um they're only available in in china in japan so in china and then out in the u.s but the japanese ones uh, i don't think too many people deal with them so um and i like diving with the rare things and, and big animals so that kind of got me started and now you mentioned about gifu and gifu is i'll, I'll put a map but gifu what, what's generally gifu is up north it's cold it's what so these salamanders actually are distributed um across uh southwestern Japan. Right? So if you take the main island of Japan, which is Honshu, where we are, right? so and Tokyo is about, you know, about in the center of Honshu, um, to the west of that, uh, if you go about 400 kilometers away from Tokyo, west of Tokyo, you get Gifu. So it's a pre pre prefecture or a region. Um, and that's where you start to get the giant salamanders. Now they're, they're distributed um, even further out, like out in Kyoto, or even down towards Kyushu as well. So um, they 
are out in very, very clean mountainous river streams, um, sometimes out in canals as well. Yeah, so Gifu is the closest place from us. And if you want to go out there, you just hop on the Shinkansen on the bullet train, right? Um, yeah, but then you said 90 minutes car drive after that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so two, so two hours two hours to get to Gifu Hashima station. And then yeah. um, the operator uh, will come pick you up. And then from there, it's just uh, it's just a ride up to the mountains for about 90 So you minutes. drive with this operator so. for 90 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got to be it's, a real uh, interesting guy for 90 minutes, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, he's 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 the salamander whisperer, so he's got all the stories to tell you for 19 all minutes. Right. So Ooh, yeah, okay. it's not, it's not a bad option. All right, so so Martin, then, then tell us so what is it actually like to dive with these things, and what is it diving actually like? Let us know. Okay, okay, sure. So there's two ways to dive with them. Uh, you can either dive uh, dive on scuba or on snorkel. Okay, mm. um, I've, I've only done the snorkel option. And the reason why I haven't done the scuba option is because most likely you're gonna be underwater at a depth of about four or five meters. Really, um, that deep? deep? Yeah, deep enough that you can't stand. Oh. And uh, most likely you're only gonna see their tail because yeah. during the daytime they're gonna be sleeping. All right. So these giant salamanders sleep during the day, they wedge mm -hmm. themselves in between these rocks or inside these holes. So if you do it on scuba, most likely you're just gonna see their back end, their tail sticking out and your dive's gonna be over in like an hour and that's gonna be it. Um, <clears throat> the other option is the, the, the one that I recommend is to be done on snorkel and that's mm -hmm. the way how I do it. So the way how it's done is that it's done at a much shallower uh, area about uh, one to two meters um, in a river where you can stand. And you basically just station yourself stationary next to the salamanders. And the salamanders, uh, although they're amphibian, they still have to breathe, right? Mm. So about every one hour or so, they actually come out of their holes and come up to the river surface mm. and they open up their mouth and that's actually the time when they breathe. So <clears throat> um, that's, that's the money shot moment, right? So you um, have to- The mouth opening to breathe. Yeah, the breathe. Yeah, that's that's the apex of the whole experience. So, gotcha. um, if you're a hardcore photographer like like me, um, what you probably want to do is do everything on snorkel, uh, make yourself stationary next to the giant salamanders, and then mm -hmm. just wait for that. You know, wait for that apex okay. moment when they come out and breathe. Question: Do you mean that the snorkel is actually out of the water while you're resting there, or do you have to keep going back up and down? What what is it? It depends on the scenario, but you could be bobbing up and down, or you could be just standing, wait, you know, looking at it from above, uh -huh. um, but you're just waiting for the salamanders to come up. Okay. And when they come up, that's when you want to take your camera and then capture that moment. I have some gotcha. videos, which that's the recommended way. Yeah, um, it's done in Because you're not river. moving a lot. Is it cold? Super cold, super cold, and you need a lot of, <laughs> need a lot of patience for it. And, <laughs> um, yeah, 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 so it's... it's. Um, Do you have a pee valve? You probably. wear a dry suit. Well, I've I've uh, had some accidents with that in the past. So, oh, no. uh, you wear a dry suit, yeah. basically, or I do. Yeah, yeah, I do wear a dry suit. Um, okay, it's, it's nice to have a P valve on it, but um, oh. the the river temperature is like ten degrees or even below. Um, especially if you go there like during the months of May, uh, then you get the the cold um, oh uh, snow melted water is flowing down yeah. through the river, right? so it's quite cold. But in the summertime, it's it's like 30, 40 degrees Celsius outside, but it's like oh. ten degrees. Oh. underwater so you, you do need a, a dry suit for this so in the cold temps are they i mean they're going to be less active or what uh, they they get more active yeah, in yeah. the warmer months or what yeah yeah so during the warmer months um you're right that they're more active and then they do come up to the surface um every one hour or so to breathe um but during the winter months um they become more sluggish um they don't move as much and although i said they have to breathe with their mouth by coming up to the river surface, they're actually capable of breathing through their skin as well. So during the winter time, most likely if you try to see them, they're probably just going to be like, you know, inside their hole, not coming up because they're capable of breathing through their skin. So in order to preserve okay. energy. How do you know which part of the stream or once you're in the stream? I mean, I assume they're endangered, so there aren't a lot of these things, right? Yeah, I, you know, that's a good question. I've wondered that, but I rely completely on the um, operator, the shark, uh, the, the salamander whisperer. And for some reason, as um, soon as you get to the site, he says, just gear up, get your camera ready. And that takes about 10, 15 minutes. And then while you're doing that, he's in the river, just around, and he goes through every hole and nooks and crannies and between rocks and whatnot. He just finds them right away. I don't know how he does Are it. You he just sure? has the, uh... Have you had trips? Have you ever had where you came up a zero or what? 
No, no, no. They're always there. Hmm. For some reason, he's he's uh, he hits the bullseye every time, and there's multiples of them, three, four of them at least. Whoa! So it's a it's a yeah. It's not a hit or miss kind of thing. They're there. Um, okay. You just have to rely on the guy to find them for you, and they're always oh, there, cool. which is quite incredible. And they're monsters. We're talking about. I'm sorry, I forget. They're what a meter plus what again? The the Japanese ones are 150 centimeters max. Uh, the adults grow up to that big. Yeah. And they can weigh up to like 25, 30 kilos. So they're quite, quite heavy. Yeah. So Martin, what, Martin, what are uh, any specific behaviors you want to, I know you were talking about a money shot, but what, what's the, you know, specific behaviors that you're really hoping for? Yeah, I guess, I guess there's, there's a couple money shots out there. One is the, um, the, the, the breathing moment. That is, um, that's kind of like the apex that you really want to go for. But the other two behaviors I want to mention, and this is probably applicable to all animals that don't think like humans, would be um, breeding or mm. reproduction. And the other one would be uh, feeding, right? Yeah. Um, those are the other two uh, behaviors that, uh, that would be interesting, I think. Um, and if, if I were to talk about eating or feeding, um, this is something you're probably not going to be able to see during the daytime because they're sleeping. Yeah. But if you get an opportunity to night dive with them, then um, you will be able to hopefully see the meat. So Which you during have. the nighttime, I have, I have seen it. Yeah, I've done it before. Um, it's actually quite scary too because it's pitch dark <laughs> and then you get all these salamanders, you know, roaming around, right? Um, use a light. If you get bitten, it's yeah, yeah, yeah you'll, you, you'll lose it. Yeah, you'll use a light. Um, okay, and then but, the bite uh, you. Well, if you if you if you're not careful, um, because they have very poor eyesight, um, so they rely on their sense, but they can sense motion. So, if you, for example, like wave your hand in front of their face, they'll probably think that it's their prey and try to bite. Right, and they have very, very sharp teeth as well. So that's something you oh, want to avoid. Um, but yeah, you'll you'll see them roaming around very, very slowly like this, you know, uh, which I'll, I'll show a video clip of it later on. But um, and hunting for food, but they're kind of like when they eat, they're kind of like, you know how frogfish eat? They're like yeah. lightning fast, right? Yeah. And they just open up their mouth and go wham, just yeah. about right. That's how they eat because their movement is so slow. So they have to rely on uh, the speed of their mouth. So if they sense anything moving in front of their face, then they just wham, zap at it. So I've, I've tried, yeah, so I've tried testing with like a small twig, you know, I've taken a yeah. small twig yeah. and I, I threw it and I threw it in front of his, you know, Oh, that's evil. They just, <laughs> yeah, they just you know, munched on it and started, you know, cow. munching so, on it. So. So. Okay, so so here's a short clip of um, the giant stallion is coming up to the surface to breathe. Uh, that's it's probably about a, yeah, that's his face, you know, about okay. the open. <laughs> oh, uh, man, that's ugly. <laughs> right there. Whoa. Uh, oh, my goodness. Slow How big is this up thing? To the surface. Whoa. This is probably about a meter, meter big, sticking this, you know, Nose and mouth out, um, taking a nice, dumping nice long it. breath. It's like dumping it. It's like yeah. swallowing it. Look at it. Comes out and there's bubbles coming out of his nose. Wow. Yeah. So as you can see, the, the river here is very, very shallow. It was maybe like 60, 70 centimeters or so. Um, so that was very, very shallow and then right you're there. You're not going to see that one for another hour, maybe. Yeah, you're not going to see that one for another hour. You're wow. Right. Yeah. yeah. So this and one's probably looks darker. Um, yeah, this one's actually, yeah, you're right. This is actually um, a much bigger uh, adult, I think. This is probably about maybe a meter, uh, a little bit over a meter, maybe 120 centimeters or so. Um, not fully grown yet, but it's uh, it's an adult. And as you can see, it's mm -hmm. kind of roaming around, which is quite rare to see during the daytime. Um, right. But, you know, I kind of, uh, I, I guess I lucked out. But if you if you do a yeah. night dive, this is how they're kind of just roaming around. Oh, wow. Uh, river, yeah, so what are you, you, know, are you backing up? You're backing up while this is happening? It, yeah, I'm backing up as this is okay. happening. Um, how deep is yeah, this? taking a video of it. This is probably maybe, you know, 100, 160, 170 centimeters or so. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Roaming around like very a good cool. but he right can't there. really see you, right? He can't, but uh, he does sense my motion. Um, okay. And of course, you're using a very large, fancy camera setup. I believe it's it the same one I've seen you with in the ocean. It's got a large. It's kind of it's one of those big ones. Um, yeah, actually, um, it's better to actually go there with a smaller setup. Um, if you go there with a very big dome port uh, it just becomes very very clumsy and 
cum cumbersome to carry it around. Um, I advise that you bring a smaller setup because you're going to be walking in, you know, um, along very, very rocky areas and you could fall and there are areas where it's very, very mossy as well. And, mm. um, you could slip and fall as well. So it's, it, it, it's a lot easier to bring a smaller setup and, and capture. What do you, what do you, for example, opinion. what are you using? Um, I, so I use a Nikon DSLR within, within a housing, but then I use a small four inch dome, dome port, uh, which makes it you know, much, much better to kind of carry around. As opposed oh, to wait, a bigger so, nine inch super. So as a, as a, so I'm a novice with with photography. So you're saying you're using the same camera body that you would use a Sharknado, for example, but it's a different it's a different front part, a different different port, different smaller. yeah different port yeah that's right yeah different okay. lens port in front of it yeah yeah gotcha alrighty thanks. Um, so I'm sharing my, I'm sharing some pictures again. So this is a, a split shot I did. Um, here's a fellow photographer in front of me photographing wow. a oh, wow. salamander. Um, I think this is a moment when it was about to come up um, uh -huh. for a breath. Um, well, that's a very small camera he's got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that works as well. Um, wow. And there's plenty of sunlight out there. So you really don't need strobes out there. Right. So it can be done um, even with a small compact digital camera, even probably with your iPhone as well. Wow. So. Okay. Here's one coming up um, to the surface to breathe. Um, here's another one that probably just took a deep breath and then just coming down to, you know, go wedge themselves uh, in between. Or you can see again. his eye on this picture, yeah? That's his eye exactly, right there, yeah, isn't yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, right, right. Huh. And uh, yeah, it's quite shallow here. You get plenty of sunlight, so you really don't need strobes in this area to take pictures. And you can see their fingers as well. They have four fingers and five yeah. toes. You can't see their toes, but they really, really um, kind of like a, like a baby's hand almost, right? It does look like it, yeah. Holding yeah, an apple. Yeah. Now that's something different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, here's another picture. Um, so this is this is what I'm talking about with salamanders going inside holes and wedging themselves in between rocks. So luckily these oh, wait, those guys are two. Are, Holy cow, I thought it was one next yeah, to a rock, but it's oh good grief. I missed that. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah, there's wow. there's two sticking their heads out. Um Usually you only see their tails, but this one, you know, luckily they're they're facing forward, so you get you get to see their faces. But um, so does yeah, this mean so, they're not territorial at all? Um, actually, that's a, that's an interesting point because um, they're not, and you'll see, you know, like five or six giant salamanders just you know on top of each other sleeping during the day. Yeah, <laughs> you know, mm. wonder how they're able to do that because um during the breeding season which i'll you know, talk about later they get very very aggressive and they fight among who, each who other doesn't? But, you know who doesn't yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah which which happens in the month of september but all the other months i guess they're you know friendly to friendly to each other and just interesting yeah, yeah just kind of and can uh, pardon, pardon me but can you can you tell the difference between males and females is it a size thing or, okay I, I don't yeah um do the males get bigger the females get bigger generally what, what's the deal there uh, I, th I'm, I think the males do get bigger than the females. They have a flatter head as well. Um, that's, I think, one of the ways to distinguish between a male and a female. I can't gotcha. be entirely sure, but I know that the males are bigger. Uh, gotcha. right. um, here's another shot here. I think it's a little bit difficult to see, but there's two actually right here. Two, one on yeah. the left um, that's about to come out. And then there's another one on the right. See that um, eye again, kind too. Of, yeah, yeah, very, very small. Um, it actually kind of reminds me of um, this lizard called a Gila monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, of course. yeah. So they, sure. I think they, they, they're around in like Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California area. It's a poisonous yeah. lizard, but they kind of yeah. look like these guys, right? And then here's another shot oh. of the giant salamander um, coming up to the surface to breathe. So this is this is the kind of shot that you know um, you want to try to take. Um, this is when it's. I think it just finished breathing. You can see the bubbles coming up um, to the surface, and this is about to. Is this one of your favorites? Down to its, um, yeah, I guess it's one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, so the other behavior that I want to talk about is breeding, which unfortunately I haven't witnessed, witnessed myself. And it happens only um, once a year, as with many animals out there, I think. But it happens in the month of September, middle of September. And as you know, it clashes with the typhoon season here in Japan. So uh, and you know the number of typhoons and the magnitude of the typhoons is getting uh, worse and worse every year. So it actually um, destroys the the river at that time. It just rains so much that the river overflows, yeah. and even if they breed, the eggs just get washed away. So it's been it's been quite a challenge. I've been trying to you know photograph that every year, but I haven't been able to do it. But apparently last year 
um, as, as you know, the typhoons weren't that bad last year and mm. they, they did succeed in breeding and I guess uh, they did lay eggs and everything like that. But mm -hmm. because of the whole corona, coronavirus situation, I didn't get a chance to go up there. But um, so the breeding, it's an incredible scene. Um, what happens is all the males basically just oh. just wrestle and not fight oh. till death. They, they fight until uh, the dominant one is, is determined. So all the losers kind of have to leave the area. The dominant male gets to rule the area and you know he gets to mate with all the females, right? And the females area. in that particular area, yeah. So he's the dominant male in that area. And the female will um, you know, uh, basically go inside the holes and lay their eggs or multiple females will do that. And once the eggs are laid, the, the dominant male becomes the den master. Not the dead master, but the dead master. So he gets the he gets the right to um, become the parental gu guardian. Um, wow. He gets to guard the den, uh, hence the dead mm. master. So he's going to be looking after the eggs for the next. Right. One he's got multiple dens to look after. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Oh. That's right. In his territory. So mm. the 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 den master gets to guard these eggs for the next one month until the eggs hatch. Right. And they, because other like, things are trying to eat these. Yeah, that's right. Or even the, the other males may even come and try to disturb it, right? Okay. So, um, yeah. And how big, how big are, they, sorry, how big are we talking here? Like, uh, like what, frog egg size, I guess, probably, or bigger? Uh, because they're yeah, bigger. yeah, probably, probably about the same size, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I, I've never seen him with my own eyes, but I've only seen pictures of him. But mm -hmm. the fascinating thing here is that the eggs are just really, really pretty. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're bright. Yeah, they're bright white, and when they're um, freshly laid, it's got this like little shade of blue on them. So it looks like they really look like pearl necklaces, actually. And oh, the males. Will, pictures? Um, I don't have any, unfortunately. But if you if you go online and search for um, the big salamander. salamander eggs, yeah, you'll, yeah. you'll 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 you know, you'll cool. come across them. But the males just basically take these eggs and you know wrap them around their neck, right? Are you or serious? Body. Yeah, and protect them. So it's a it's a real um, it's a moment that I really want to see and take pictures of. But yeah, unfortunately, I haven't had, a, uh, had the opportunity or chance to do that. Yeah. Huh. So that's that's another behavior that um, is something to to. Okay. To and then after. once they hatch, they're on their own. They're on their own. Uh, okay. You know, like they become like tadpoles, and then off they go until they metamorphose into like a lizard, like get some legs, like salamander, yeah. get some legs, and start walking around. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So they're endangered because of what? Is it endangered or threatened? Pardon me. Um, let's see. Um, they are maybe all of the above. No, <laughs> but they're uh, considered to be uh, vulnerable on the IUCN red list of uh, threatened species. Right? Mm. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why the population is declining. And one of the reasons is because of the <clears throat> Chinese giant salamander. Right. And you might have like, <laughs> yeah, you might have like question marks as to why that's the case. But so um, the giant salamanders, even in Japan, uh, they were consumed. Yeah. Back in the day, um, people used to eat them <clears throat> up until the 1950s or so uh, when the government put a ban on it. So they're protected now. They're not eaten here in Japan. But in China, um, they are still eaten. Um, they're considered to be quite luxurious. And um, in China, apparently there aren't that many left in the wild. You can only find them in commercial farms and they farm it for, you know, selling to restaurants and stuff like that. And apparently they, they farm like about 2 million a year or something like that is, is the figure that I heard. But um, so back in the day, the, the Chinese giant salamanders are actually brought over to Japan for consumption purposes as well, hmm. right? Um, long, long time back. And, uh, but after the government put restrictions on it, um, well, these owners of these giant, giant salamanders probably released them out in the wild into the rivers. So you get these Chinese giant salamanders uh, roaming in the river streams and they're breeding with the, the pure Japanese giant salamanders. So now we're getting these crossbred hybrid types of you know, giant salamanders out there. Um, and because of that, the number of the, the pure Jap Japanese giant salamanders is, is declining. Um, so because that's, they're, that's out, they're out competing them somehow for food or for mates or for what? Do you know how that's um, happening? Well, because the, the, the Chinese ones are mating with the Japanese ones, hence, you know, you get these hybrids. And so the Japanese ones aren't, you know, they're just- Okay. So the hybrid number is just going up. Okay. Just going up and Have up and up. Have you seen any of these hybrids? 
I, I haven't. And the place where I go in Gifu, um, they've done DNA tests in the rivers, particular river that I go to. And the ones in Gifu where I go, um, they are the pure Japanese ones. Um, most of the crossbred types are out in Kyoto and west of Kyoto oh, gotcha. as well. Okay. That's, that's gotcha. what I've heard, yeah. Um, so that's, that's one threat. The other threat is uh, poaching. Um, there's one story that I can tell you. Um, apparently, so at the place that, that I go to, there's a big, nice campsite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are people like setting up tents and camping. And um, the story I heard is that uh, one night, um, some, some guys pull up his car next to the river, got out and oh. um, took a shirt off to, you know, go inside the river. But when he took a shirt off, apparently he had a full body tattoo. Oh, right. And you and I know here in Japan and that, you know, it's a bit of a taboo hush hush type thing yeah. that if you have a full body tattoo, most likely you're associated with the Yakuza or the gang. So yeah. this guy probably was associated with, with the gang. And um, so he took his, you know, um, shirt off and then he dove straight into the river, just snatched one out and brought it back inside his car and just drove off. So <laughs> there are poachers out there. Most likely they're doing it for, you know, kind of. Oh, so yeah. poaching is, I think, is another threat. Um, and the other ones are... Uh, you know, decline in uh, natural habitat due to uh, pollution, um, mm -hmm. you know, humans creating dams and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. So there's less and less space for them to live, um, mm -hmm. less nesting ground. Um, and um, also uh, the weather is impacted as well. So as I said a little bit earlier, um, you know, there's more and more typhoons here in Japan. The frequency and the magnitude is getting more and more. So um, even if the salamanders breed, eggs are laid, they just overflow and just get washed away. So the past five years, it's um, they, they haven't been able to successfully breed and lay eggs, except for last year when it happened, but I wasn't able to witness it, unfortunately. Is it, is it possible to artificially breed them and then like put the polywogs out into the wild? Does that work at all or no? Uh, I don't know, actually. Hmm. Um, that's an idea. Maybe you could you know, propose it. <laughs> I wonder. And the, and the other question I have, so then uh, if the hybrids are kind of a threat, do they like encourage people? Uh, maybe they wouldn't. I, I'm wondering if like encourage people to hunt the hybrids, but then maybe people wouldn't know and they would be getting both breeds yeah. or something. Yeah, I don't know how that works. Um, Probably don't want to encourage oh, it. And what I've heard is that the, the, the Chinese ones are a lot more aggressive than the Japanese ones. So of course. the Japanese <laughs> ones are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how that. I don't and, know what they're, bigger. they're bigger too. Yeah any tips or advice for people who are looking to do this trip? Yeah, um, I guess uh, first, um, I think you need to really assess and make sure this is something that you'd really want to do because in my opinion, this is a little bit more for um, hardcore photographers who really want to take pictures of um, up close and personal um, because you are going to have to be uh, kind of stationary most of the time standing or sitting next to you know these holes where the salamanders are supposed to be so you'll be doing this for hours and hours trying to wait you know wait for the salamanders to come up to the surface right so make sure that this is something that you really want to do before you invest the money in doing um, and another uh, tip is uh, don't bring such a big camera with a big dome port and huge strobe because there's just gonna be it's gonna be such a big drag that you won't be able to kind of maneuver around and take uh, nice pictures there's plenty of sunlight you really don't need a huge dome port for this area mm -hmm. um and then the other one is uh i guess there's a mountain guest house up there uh so-called linchku um mm -hmm. which is a really really nice area out in the wilderness out in the mountains mm -hmm. as soon as you go in there you just get this like there's a big bear hide hanging from the wall and they give you all sorts of uh, local dish and everything like that. But this- Do you stay overnight? Yeah. I do, yeah. Um, I do stay overnight at this uh, guest house out in the mountains. Okay. And then, um, which is close by, it's about five, 10 minutes drive from, okay. from the river. Then this was my next question. So, because I was wondering if you do this as a day trip or a weekend, because you basically yeah. got three, three and a half hours out there. And then yeah. would you do that as a day trip or you, you would stay overnight? I, I personally wouldn't do as it a, as a day trip because you're not going to finish until around 4 or 5 p.m. I guess you can you can adjust it um, according to your schedule, but most likely you're going to want to stay there until the evening or so. By that time, you're, you're just so tired and knackered that you just want to you know, yeah. stay overnight in a, in a place nearby. So it's more convenient, so what, I think, to stay there. Yeah. What, what time to what time is the diving usually? The diving is usually from like 10, 10.30. You start um take a quick lunch break and then um 
uh, you, you keep doing the same thing um, until around four or five p.m. until sunset. That's a long day, man. Or if you, <laughs> or if you, you know, and, and if you opt to do the um, night dive, you can, you know, keep keep doing it as well. The operator will uh, cater towards that. So and the night dive will be like from eight p.m. until like ten p.m. Uh huh. How many people yeah. uh, in these trips usually? Um, usually in small groups. Um, there have been times when I'm the only guest or uh, there have been times when there have been people up to like eight, you know, there's only one guide. So there's only a, you know, a number of, a certain number of people that the guide can cater yeah. towards. But uh, so it's a, it's a full one man show that this guy does, it's Mr. Ito. Um, but, uh, you know, it's usually in smaller groups. Aside from the transportation fee, what would it be like for a day of, of diving? Um, you, so I've never done just a, you know, day trip, but, um, oh, true. I've usually, yeah, done it as a weekend trip, um, Saturday, Sunday type thing. So, um, excluding the, uh, the bullet train ride. So anything mm -hmm. beyond that, um, food and everything in inclusive, including the, the accommodation, it's about, um, 30,000. Yeah. So about $300 or so okay. for, for, for what, two what days plus the guide and everything. Yeah. Okay. What would the uh, what would the transportation be round trip? About another hundred bucks or something? Maybe twenty thousand yen round trip gotcha. on the on the fast bullet train. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so all in all, have... probably about twenty thousand yen plus thirty thousand yen. So about it's about a fifty thousand five hundred dollar uh, trip weekend trip. Gotcha. So um, I've actually been diving and photographing for about ten. 10 years now, 10, 11 years, um, I decided to kind of pursue the underwater photography path. And that's, that, that's you know, that's what I've been doing as a hobby um, on the weekends. And uh, I've, I've published quite a few articles and photographs um, in some of the magazines out in the UK, namely Dive Magazine. Um, I've been a regular contributor to um, uh, X-Ray Magazine as well, um, mm -hmm. especially on diving in Japan. So you can search online, I'm sure you'll come across some yeah. of What were some of the topics? I forget. Um, so I think one was on uh, Sharknado, so uh, Shark diving with the uh, sharks here in the banded house sharks here in behind me. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, right here. In, in Chiba, uh, Japan. Um, okay. I've done some articles on diving in Okinawa, Miyakojima, um, and then a separate article on the opposite end, so up in Hokkaido, where you get the you know cold winter diving. Um, I've covered some articles on, you know, uh, but I have my own personal website. Um, it's uh, http colon slash slash www.poseidonphotos.com. Yeah, right. <laughs> so make sure it's Poseidon Photos with an S because there's another website out there that's poseidonphoto.com. It's not my website. So. And uh, any any last uh, any last comments? Uh, One last comment from from me is that um, yeah. I guess if you're interested in doing this sort of trip, um, you can you know feel free to reach out to me at my website. There's a web form query form. So if you uh, reach out to me, I can help you get in touch with the uh, operator, the guy, the salamander whisperer out there. So I'll be cool. more than happy to help you out for that. Ito yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. All right. Thanks. I say thank you to Martin for, for that. Um, Martin's uh, links I'll, I'll put here. The, he has the photography links. As he said, you're welcome to contact him if you're uh, curious about this trip. And uh, do you also have a YouTube channel or any other public media? I don't know. Okay. Just, all right. Just I'll just my, put, I'll just put my, my YouTube channel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's all we care about here right now. <laughs> all, right. all right, Martin. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.